Hello, hello, and welcome to the CTB Show. Today is exactly March 7th. The weather is delightfully springy. There's a third thing here I'm supposed to say. I blew it! Welcome to the show. My name is Evan the Merritt. That is Brian the Levy. Very ready for today. Very excited. Yo, totally prepped. Uh, that is Casey the Kasem. Are we having fun yet? <laughs> Good job. Is Party Down coming back? Uh, there. Yeah. That's what, looks, that's what it looks like. Best news of the day. And because this is a very special episode, we are going to introduce our guest right away. Baltimore Sun crime reporter Justin Fenton. Say hello. Hello. Good to be back. <laughs> yeah, very excited to be here after I think the last time we spoke to you was in June-ish. Who knows? Because COVID. Uh Justin has a book out. It's called We Own This City, a true crime story. Hey, Brian, move over so I can read that. <laughs> a true story of crime, cops, and corruption on sale now on Amazon and various other places where you can get books. Uh, uh, now seems to be the right time. Justin, whose nose am I picking? Is that Wayne Jenkins? <laughs> that is Wayne Jenkins, yep. Wayne Jenkins, who uh, is sort of un definitely one of the main characters, if not the main character of this uh narrative tale that took place all of us lived through it in baltimore city and we are going to do some deep dives on the uh the contents of this book because we read it from front to back it is very very uh digestible um page turner if you will no wasted space endorsement that, by the way i love to hear that because i thought what i turned in was a very dense narrative with lots of information covering a lot of ground with many characters and, and everybody Everybody seems to say it's a page turner. I never. I'm just delighted to hear that. So thank you for saying it too. I know it's absolutely true. I mean, for the amount of information that's being thrown at you, uh, it, it. I mean, it's difficult to put it all together while you're reading it. But then when you go back and think about it, the way that everything played into each other is insane. Um, but basically, I really like how you you played with. You know, you had Sh uh, Sean Suter sh show up at the beginning. And then he doesn't even make an appearance until another appearance until two thirds of the way through the book. And I thought that yeah. was, you know, I'm just waiting. It's the, uh, gosh, it's hard to say Chekhov's gun, but it was the Chekhov's, Chekhov's gun, gun with Sean Suter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's dropped in a few times, but yeah, that was, that was the biggest structural question I had was sort of how do I not make him somebody who, spoiler alert, uh, is shot at the end of the book? I mean, he has to, you have to be thinking about him. You have to be wondering about him. And it made so much sense not just for to get him in people's minds early, but also the Umar Burley character who had heroin planted on him and went to uh, prison falsely. I mean, it just sort of sets the tone. And um, that was, but that, other than that, you know, this is the first, maybe only book I, I, I'm going to write. And uh, I thought we found the, the process kind of, um, everything kind of clicked into place once I figured out that, that structure. So anyway. Uh, no, well, so, so let's talk about the process. Like, so you, I, I guess when you started working on this book, you didn't know that you were working on a book, right? You were just doing your job. Yeah, I mean, there. so I wanted to write a book. It, it, you know, it, it, David Simon, the creator of The Wire, it, it came to me during the um, the trial, which was in January 2018. He said, man, this is a book. I don't know anything about that. I don't know how to begin that process. So I sort of was kicking the, kicking the can on that, like, you know, trying to write a proposal. But my first objective was to write a series for The Sun, and that ended up taking... You know, I, I took probably a, a year, although people lie about stuff like that. It's not like a year only working on it, but uh, that, that came out in like June of 2019. And by that time, I had secured a deal and sort of just kept kept going. I, I, I took what I had already assembled and, and started. I took six months off from the paper and just tried to report the hell out of it and, and write at the same time. Um, so uh, that, that's how that came together. And, and before we, we should also say this is the story of the, uh, the Gun Trace Task Force. Um, and, and the police officers involved, the people who had the, uh, the crimes that they committed, the people who the, the, they had robbed, um, it was, it, I mean, it's a hell of a story. But it also loops in, you know, the events of 2015, spring 2015, like the uprising, the riots, and this and that and the other. <clears throat> um, even further back, the sort of the policies that got us to that point, and right. sort of the way the winds shifted. I mean, one of the things, I was talking to somebody else about this the other day, was that, um, you know, as recently as 20, 2010, 2014, people were seeking out like, the endorsement of the Fraternal Order of Police and talking about, you know, working closer with cops and support our cops. I mean, the, the pendulum has swung so much. The, 
the, the FOP's endorsement now. Nobody wants that. I mean, it's right. Like, and it's like that, was, but not 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 too long ago, like political races were being won on like supporting cops to get crime down and, and stuff like that. And, and you see that shift in Marilyn Mosby, which I, I highlight in one of the chapters. But you know, yeah, I was going to say, uh, well, once we start getting into our notes, uh, that Marilyn Mosby actually figures fairly prominently in in, in the story. And uh, I mean, I have my opinions of her, but one thing that I took away. Uh, from her portrayal was a lot more sympathetic than I ever thought I would be, especially given her background. I was unaware that, you know, uh, she was touched by violent crime and that was what inspired her to get into uh, being a lawyer. Was there anything new that, like, you learned about her or, or are you just, like, so up on all of these people in general that <laughs> that nothing came as a surprise? I, I mean, I wanted to capture her campaign and sort of, you know, I remember her campaign, but as I, as I dove deeper, I mean, one of the funny things that I found was like, she did a radio interview where she's railing against, you know, we have to be tough on crime. And a caller calls in and says, you know, you sound like a Republican, you know, and that's something anybody would say about her now and the image that she's been able to fashion. And I really, what I try to conclude about her is not that she's a, a phony or an opportunist, but that like, maybe, maybe the real phony was, the one who was running is tough on crime. I mean, she very much has in her background and her history, you know, um, someone who is, you know, sympathetic to the effects of, of, of the drug war and, 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 and crime on the black community. And, and it's almost, I, I think that what I've concluded is that she ran how she thinks she thought she needed to run to get into office and then right. shifted, she changed. But, but I also think that people can read that different ways. And, and honestly, that's what I tried to do throughout the book is like, I don't think, I'm not trying to force an opinion or agenda on anybody. There's a lot of different viewpoints and a lot of different things where I want to sort of make up their mind. And that's one of them. Yeah, I think uh, I think that was very effective, the way that she was portrayed, not in any kind of bias. I mean, it was just pretty straightforward stuff, um, which I could be could be said of the entire book. There are there is not there does not seem to be any opinion injected into it, especially uh, when with regard to what happened to Souter, because we still don't fucking know what happened to the guy. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, you, you as a reporter, aren't supposed to share your opinion. I mean, like officially, but um, yeah, get, I, I was very curious, and that's what kept me furiously reading toward the end. Was like, holy shit, what happened to this guy? I need to know. And there is still not a conclusion. <laughs> but a lot of new information. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was impressed about uh, uh, how current uh, up to the very end. Like we're still talking about January of 2020, and. Uh, uh, Wayne Jenkins' uh, CD or whatever, where, <laughs> my yeah. good lord. Yeah, I was even able to sneak in stuff from the George Floyd uh, uprisings in June 2020. I mean, the book was yeah, done, and the epilogue was truly to, uh, like something that, that occurred to me in the spring of 2020, and I was able to say, hey, can I can I get one more thing in? <laughs> and, uh, it, and that's actually one of my, my favorite parts of the book. It means a lot to me. Um, well, I don't know if I should say it, but, uh, you know, I've reunited... I it was it was chronicled at the time during the uprise, during the, the the riots, the unrest, whatever you want to call them. I tweeted about how I was sort of like taken under the the, the wing of a of a Crips gang member. I mean, he identified himself as that to me, and he kind of protected me. And I got his number at the time, and I always wanted to reconnect with him. And like then, like when I tried it, it, it didn't work anymore. And then I found him on Facebook, but we, he was like out of town, and I reconnected with him for the book, and that's the epilogue. So uh, that, that that meant a lot to me. Yeah, that's a very that's a very compelling short story. Like I, I find that the book actually has all these like two page short stories of the GTTF doing these horrible things that like my mouth is just open widely, and I have to read it aloud to my girlfriend because it just seems so incredulous the things that these people did and got away with for a very long time. Uh, uh, sorry, Brian, you were about to say something. Well, I mean. I was going to ask you about the job. Was this the guy who went on like Larry Wilmore and he had been on a bunch of TVs? It's, it's the same guy, right? I didn't realize it at the time. When, when I went back and like, like when I was trying to find him, I Googled his name. I was like, oh, wow. Like, he was all over the place. Like he was one of those guys involved with the, the gang truce, you know, again, whether people want right. it was authentic or not, you know, he was one of those guys and that ended up getting him a lot of attention and, and it didn't really, that was just like a, a, a fleeting moment, you know. After that was over, he was he was back to being Charles Shelley, you know, and, and he was trying to get by and trying to get out of um, a life of crime. So um, yeah, it was really interesting and worthwhile to sort of reconnect with him and reflect on that years later and as the George Floyd stuff was coming up, because you know um, we this city. It seems like every city across the country last year had 
uprisings, unrest, riots, whatever you want to call it. And Baltimore really didn't. You know, we mm-hmm. made, we were on the news for like weeks straight in 2015 for that, and it didn't happen here. And I think that's because, uh, you know, there's I'm pro- probably a million reasons why, but a lot of it I think was people saying, you know, it didn't. In a way, it wasn't worth it. You know, the, those of us who got arrested, the, you know, those of us who got hurt, or businesses that got, that got hurt, like people here wanted a different approach. I think um, certainly people who did want to do it again try to get them they're angry things didn't change enough the gttf happened post 2015 i mean you know, that's that that was one of the most striking things of putting all the pieces together i sort of made this giant timeline when i started compiling the book of like i want ma- major events in the city in, in the gray case in the consent decree process and i want to overlay things the gun trace task force was doing and you find over and over and over again when there's a a major like verdict in the, one of the baltimore six cases you know like they're robbing somebody that day while all eyes are on the courthouse and the national media is focused on the gray case. And they're like, it's almost like it gave them cover to do that stuff. And at a time when officials were telling the city, we're, you know, we're improving this police department, you know, we're getting a civil rights investigation, we're getting a consent decree, we're on the way to cleaning this up. And like, these guys are so not impressed by that, so undeterred. And it, it really, like you said, it's, it's shocking. It, it, you can't make this stuff up. Um, but so we've talked about a lot of the characters around the gun trace task force. Uh, I'd like to talk about a few of those guys. Um, let's start with, let's start with Wayne Jenkins. The, I mean, the ringleader. Uh, so these guys were robbing drug dealers. They would identify uh, people with money, you know, you know, drug dealers with money uh, and they would go after them in their homes. They'd stop them uh, for bullshit reasons uh, and they would rob them. Where do they come up with this idea? Like, how did <laughs> like how do they decide? Was it just because they were kind of skimming off the top, and then they're like, "No one's watching us to begin with. Let's just go harder." I mean, yeah, I think that I, so people, the people involved in the case who've kind of spoken out, who either cooperated with the government, or in one case, one of the officers did speak to me extensively. Um, you know, they they do describe this culture of skimming off the top, but that like. There's some folks who are like, well, if we can do that, like, I wonder what else we can get away with. So, you know, and, then, and there's also two levels to what Jenkins is doing, which is one was the car stops. So we're just going out every night and saying, Let's stop as many people as we can on like for seatbelt violations. You know, what the video, the body camera video, stuff they're willing to put on camera was then like stopping someone for a seatbelt violation when they're five feet off of a gas pump. Yeah. And- Search, and they end up searching their car and and you know but then there was like you say these these guys who he called monsters he would identify either through informants or intelligence or whatever you know who are some of the players in town even asking someone like that well who, who's bigger than you who would you rob if you had a chance to and then you know again what's the incentive for somebody who's got six kilos of cocaine and 200 grand to say you know what i you know i did have that stuff and i actually had more and the cops stole it i mean Defense attorneys would say to me, you know, I don't even bother with this. If, if a client tells me that, I tell them, forget it. It doesn't matter. You know, how are we going to get you out of this case? Because that's not it. That's not going to help you get out of this. And that's how, that's what, you know, there's this, I think one of the things I try to show in the book is that I think some folks have this attitude that like, oh, everybody knew and had like everybody just turned a blind eye. And it's like people, people didn't know to a certain extent. I mean, I mean these are, these are you're going after people who have incentive not to say anything. They are lying about it. They are covering their tracks. They are making fake videos to make, you know, it appear as though everything's on the up and up. And that's, and that's even people who, you know, don't, don't forget, we talk a lot about how the entire unit was indicted. That's not actually true. Well, there was one member of the unit who was not indicted because they could not connect him to any crimes. And so if you have somebody who's part of the unit who doesn't know about it or isn't partaking in it, you know, how, how in the world is someone else supposed to know? Well, I, I think the what book I is... To try to convey. I, well, I think the book is super damning of departments, uh, you know, Baltimore police, like, uh, heads, you know, like, who's ever in charge of that department. Like, the emails that they would send jerking off Wayne Jenkins and just yeah. being like, oh, you're the fucking greatest, Wayne. How do we do it without you? And he's like, oh, please, sir, can I just have two more Lincoln automobiles, please? <laughs> like... I mean, it's, it's the emails insane. Were, the emails are fascinating and, um, and hard to get, by the way. Uh, but, uh, but uh, yeah, they, they routinely show them saying, like, hey, can you, what, what will we do without you? And can, can you teach others how to do what you do? Um, <laughs> you 
know, they were really happy with the results. Um, and no one was following through about what well, actually, you know, it's funny. One of the officers in the book, Brian Gwynn, whose story is, is very important to the book, but um, he recalled sitting on his toilet one morning and flipping through his departmental emails. And he sees that Jenkins sent out an email saying his, his team got five guns a night before. He's like, you can't get five guns in a night if you're doing stuff the right way. And it's like, and then the bosses are sort of like, either they, either they feel that way and are, don't want to say anything or they're just completely enamored with the results and don't want to, and, and are just like, great, do it again. Do it again tonight. I, how much it's, it's wild. The, the one thing that sticks out to me is you know, <laughs> post riot, you have Davis comes in as the commissioner and you described a meeting where I, I guess it was in like an auditorium and they basically took all the plainclothes officers and told them, go out there, get the crime under control, do what you got to do. And, did that, does that kind of, do you think that kind of empowered the, uh, the task force or? Yes, just, I mean, there was a, there was like a, um, a boomerang effect where the police department came under such scrutiny and there was, there was, again, there was protests and everyone is, is t talking about changing laws around law enforcement officers, bill of rights and stuff. Even in Marilyn Mosby's office, there's this boomerang effect where all of a sudden people felt like they had to make, they had to win the officers back over, that the officers were so disgruntled at the way they were being treated and the way they were being talked about and that they were maybe laying down on the job in certain respects that people start, felt like they had to start making it up to them. You see, it's, you know, this is a very brief line in the book, but it, won't, it stands out to me. There's a judge who says that the officers did the wrong thing when they got a gun off somebody and she ends up apologizing to them. She's like, you know, but, 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 but I don't want you to think we don't appreciate what you're doing. Like, keep, keep, keep doing a good job. You know, this is in a hearing where she's throwing out evidence because they went about it the wrong way. So, I, you know, that moment where the department is saying, we need you guys to get back to doing what you do. And everybody's sort of like, OK, let's let's go. I mean, that yeah, that, that that's a moment where they are, you know, instead of feeling under pressure from all the, the scrutiny, they're, they're being told, don't worry about that. Like, you know, go back out there. Well, it, it's, it's strange because it, it seems like when you hear, you know, Things like defund the police, but you learn that the Baltimore Police Department is half or over half of Baltimore's budget. And like, unless th these guys are getting complete and utter support, they fall apart. They're like, why don't you like us? And it's like, well, I mean, I just read this very good book that says gave me a whole lot of reasons to not like you guys. But they're like, you know, it's the egos that just a couple bad me. apples, Brian. It's but if I mean, Christ. Well, they're they're giving the bad apples license. I also think, yeah, I mean, if if it's going to be interwoven in the narrative of defund the police, and I really do think that's an issue of bad branding in terms of policy, uh, th it needs to be brought up that these bad apples, quote, uh, are costing the city millions and millions of dollars uh, via lawsuits, settlements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Justin, I don't know if you're seeing that being used at all. Is it? I mean, yeah, it's always it's always been a thing. I, I think, um, you know, this GTTF case led to, you know, I think the, the latest number was like something like 15 million alone. Um, it's it definitely cost the city year in year in and year out. And one of the interesting things, you know, as show early in Jenkins' career when he gets sued a few times, he wasn't getting sued later in his career. Early on in his career, he, he made he did some things that got him in civil court. And you know, there's judgments that are the juries assign, and he, they don't have to pay it. And, you know, there's an argument that they shouldn't have to because no one would want to do the job if a, they had to personally pay a judgment. But, like, it's also no skin off his back when it when the, the, the judgment against him comes in. The city pays it, and nobody from internal affairs or the law department follows through to say, hey, by the way, that guy just cost us 75 grand or 150 grand. Can you, like, do something about him? They just go back to work. Yeah, that was one of the, one of the through lines that it, it – you know, the individuals were not responsible. It's the police department because they're doing these things while in the process of doing their job, which is an interesting legal argument. I, I hate it uh, that all of us should suffer because of this dingus who wants to steal $200,000 from a guy's safe and other things. Speaking of dinguses, there are a couple of, there are a couple of guys that I want to mention. And it's, it's Ryan and Gondo. Are they supposed to be comic relief? Because by the <laughs> end of the book, I thought they were almost funny. I mean, the wiretap conversations. Anytime you're going to get two people with their guard completely down, there there are some. Uh, and you know, I, I wanted to uh, 
what was the one exchange where I just my, my editor wanted to cut it. The guys just say fuck yeah to each other. They say fuck, yes, fuck yeah, and he's like, we don't need ten fuck yeahs. No, 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 we need all of them because that's <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> it really brings the conversation out. <laughs> let that fuck yeah back and forth. Just let, let it let it breathe. Yeah, that was the one of the one of the two pagers that I read aloud to my girlfriend because I couldn't stop laughing at the dialogue at the on that last. Well, bit. well, they definitely remind me of, and, and of, well, I think we'll talk about this more in a, in a little bit. Um, Detective Souter and uh, what's his name from The Wire? Like, you know, I I, I fan casted those two guys um, uh, in those roles. I don't I I only looked up Wayne Jenkins. Boy, is that a punchable face or what? <laughs> but like, I did not look up uh, what the other guys looked like. But you know, I, I fan cast. Yeah, we'll get into workshopping the TV show for sure uh, after I get through my copious list of notes. I do have a couple of r- just random observations and questions for you um, because Ed Norris comes is mentioned in the very beginning. Um, why is he still in Baltimore? <laughs> <laughs> He's a sports talk radio host, and uh... yeah. I, I feel like he's a Brooklyn guy. He should go back to Brooklyn and stop dunking on Baltimore City every goddamn chance he gets on Fox 45 when they have him on to plug Ed Norris undercover or whatever the shit it's called. Uh, and But, you know, and if I'm going to heap uh, some dunks on some uh, other former people involved in city politics, Martin O'Malley, because uh, in an interview, I, I remember when, you know, Ed Norris and then Kevin Davis, or sorry, yeah, Kevin Davis, he was in an interview and, and the interview was basically like, hey, do you regret any of these decisions with regards to these, you know, commissioners and stuff like that? And he's just like, no, Mm-mm. nope, because he was running for governor and uh, he needed to tout like these these, well, arguably cooked statistics via city stat and things like that. Uh, that's just an observation of mine. Nobody needs to comment on it. But um, it was, well, I will say to your point, one, a veteran officer who, who read the book uh, reached out to me and said, you know, he's like, you know, those New York guys are who brought a lot of this stra- these strategies to, you know, we had not just one New York commissioner, but two. And that was when they were really doing the zero tolerance and, you know, locking people up for, for minor things. And, and it, you know, they say that, that, you know, this is one man's opinion, but he said those New York, is, those New York guys are the ones who, you know, screwed this up. Now, that's not to say that, you know, the police department started having issues in, in like the early early 2000s. I'm, this certainly goes back, you know, further than, than that, but uh, or forever if you want to argue that. But uh, the New York guys had a lot of influence in sort of some of these tactics. Uh, yeah, and everybody was sort of pro zero tolerance, broken window theory when O'Malley was in office, and then talking about a boomerang effect. Like later on, everyone's like, "No, that was a terrible idea." <laughs> I mean, it was it, you know, people got on the cover of Time magazine for what happened in New York City. You know, the, it, it's it you know by you know they 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 it, they drastically brought down crime in New York City. It was a miracle, and everybody who did it was hailed as a hero. And O'Malley was like, "Let's do that here." And so he brings New York guys, brings New York programs here. But it just goes to show that not everything uh, can be duplicated. We have different well, issues. It, it's like the war on drugs. It, it, the war the war on drugs had the same deleterious effects as the war on broken windows you know i mean either way they 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 both took like a generation of guys off the streets in certain neighborhoods and like they haven't recovered since you know it's you know bad taillights lead to getting found for your third gram of weed and you go to jail for 20 years you know it's nuts yeah i would just like to say as an aside uh one of the things that i put in my notes is like how utterly absurd it is how much cash some of these people were just walking around with uh I, I, you couldn't catch me walking around with 20 grand in a, in a, in, a, in anything um but the idea that the the one officer who dumped like 20 grand in cash like if you were walking around in the woods and just found 20 grand in cash what would you do <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I know some people who are very dubious of that story. They, they just don't believe that he, he did that or that that never, like, sort of was noticed or anything. But maybe maybe someone just had a, night, a very uh, lucrative uh, walk one night and <laughs> came back a, a much richer person. But I'm, I guess what I'm asking the group is, if you had to launder $20,000 in cash, <laughs> how would you go about doing it? Because you can't make large purchases. Uh, I guess you could just buy groceries for the rest of the decade on nothing but cash but yeah like the the one guy who had 400 grand or whatever it is safe like what do you do with that amount of cash well i think it's being used to for the next purchase but uh yeah 
But that just leads to more cash. Like, you get into the Breaking Bad situation where you've got an empty warehouse with a mountain of cash in it that you can't do anything with. Eh, whatever. <laughs> and then Wayne Jenkins comes along and steals it and goes to Miami for three weeks. Why do you think... Uh, so, I, I was looking over the Reddit AMA before we started, and, and someone asked you the link between, you know, Wayne Jenkins' early career in the Marines where he got... Uh, an honorable discharge and the fact that he turned into, you know, a criminal mastermind. What happens in between? Why, why do you think, well, and, and you said that there may be some new things. Can you tell us anything new about that? Or uh, like, why do you um, think he goes from Marine to criminal? Yeah. I don't want to like stereotype Marines, but you know, I think the, the job definitely affect, uh, attracts uh, people, see, thrill seekers or people who have been in combat and things like that. And they're, 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 you know, in the academy, they are taught that this is a you know a war on drugs, a war on crime. That everybody is in the piece of, you know, yeah. They they want to they want everyone to go home at, at the end of the day, and and a lot of that then revolves around you know being uh, on you know on you know hyper alert and 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 perceiving everyone as a potential threat. And I just saw a video on on Twitter yesterday where two officers are in a helping a woman move out of her house from an abusive husband, and the minute the video goes on for two minutes. And at the last 10 seconds, the, the husband rushes in the front door firing a gun. So, I mean, it's not as though that, oh. raw, that is misplaced fear, but it also leads to this sort of like, treat everybody as, as, a, as an enemy combatant or potential danger. And, you, you know, you sort of get what you get. But that, that, what I was alluding to is sort of, I, we don't still, we don't yet know. And Jenkins, despite, despite being able to talk to dozens and dozens and dozens of people who either worked with him or were, victimized by him or whatever grew, grew up with him um with the police academy with him he still remains like enigmatic it's not clear when this started or how um i found a you know an incident from 2006 that you know someone's making a credible claim of stuff going on then and that would have been just a few years into his time on the force but it, it, it you know he the government believes him to be an unreliable narrator that he's not he can't be trusted that the things he says are lies and you know, we haven't heard from him. He's not really spoken out except for that one time he sent me a package sort of claiming this was all made up, which, you know, <laughs> you know, that, that very, was I, very, I, very Trumpian I to, of him. I got to end the book on a, on a like sort of a comic note where he, he sends a, a video to me saying that, um, you know, this video absolves him. It proves that he's not, not, he didn't do these things. And uh, I reached out to one of his, his officers who worked with him. who's also doing prison time. He's like, oh, he's, he's up to his old tricks again. So, yeah. Where is that video? Is it like on the internet? <laughs> well, no, what he did was he sent, someone had sued him. Someone had come forward after the fact and said that a gun was planted on him. And Jenkins was able to find body camera footage of the incident that shows that that's not true. I mean, it just, it, it does unequivocally show that the guy did have a gun. He, he admitted it. He tried to throw it and you can see it. So Jenkins is like, aha, see, like everybody says I planted guns and I'm just full of it. Um, <laughs> planting guns was not really, that gets over shattered like this was not about planting guns and drugs i'm not saying it didn't happen either but this is that's not that wasn't like the the mo of this group their mo was stopping people without cause um you know in order to get their stats up and then sometimes stealing stuff off the top lots of things off the top um so one of the things that i was fascinated about is in these true crime books and i've read a lot i've read serpico you know wise guy uh, uh casino you know I, these are I, these are my jam for a while <laughs> there's always the sex element. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> where's the sex in the book, Justin? There, there was this was almost chaste, except well, for the, is, you know, the there, crime uh, of murder. If I'm not mistaken, there is a stripper who gets robbed, but uh, that's right. <laughs> find her. I tried to find her. It happened at the mill stream, and I called the manager saying, "Does anybody remember this incident?" And, uh, and we, you know, yeah. But uh, that's the closest we get to that here. <laughs> yeah, I'm so the, glad that no you jilted mistress. Um, what what did you what do you think and and Wayne's wife is barely a character. I mean, is where is she in all of this? You know, wasn't able to talk to her, and she wasn't uh, implicated with anything. I think the FBI definitely wants to know where the money is, although they they think that he may have just blown through it. Um, you know, one of the things that I came across, I think after I'd finished the book, or largely, was that a this may be a, a tangent, but. Uh, in his sentencing memorandum, sort of submitting letters from family and things like that to show his character, they included pictures from a trip uh, to a uh, like a, a, a one of those tiger the uh, Doc Antle South Carolina 
uh, Tiger King place. <laughs> but, the, the COVID crossover we need. Yeah, it was no totally. <laughs> I was watching Tiger King, and all of a sudden it occurred to me. I was like, "Wait a minute, that's where he was." Like, yeah, we had a, we had a Tiger King GTTF crossover there. Um, but yeah, no, his family his family wasn't willing to talk. I, I made many attempts. Um, you know, they spoke in the, some of the letters, but yeah, we we still don't don't know his. Yeah, he was it, what is interesting about him is people he worked with said he was always at work, and his people in his personal life said he's always with his family, always helping out. And it's, it's amazing to me. There's other officers who fit that description too, where they're sort of everything to everyone. And I you know I don't know about you guys. I don't have the time. I mean, I feel like I'm never there for people the way I should, and there's never enough time in the day. And and you know, people just spoke of like, oh my god, he he, he chaperones every field trip, and then the officers are saying he sleeps in his office and he's never, you know, always working. It's uh, it's an incredible. And then to keep th think of all the lies that he had going at the same time. Yeah. In, in straight, it's it's exhausting. That's a lot of plates to spin. Oh, oh on top of all of the overtime fraud. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I guess my, my thought on maybe final thought on Jenkins as a, as a character is, uh, thank God we didn't have eight of them, uh, cause he did a lot of damage. And, uh, if we had more than one of him on the force, I, I think it will, boy, that could have been much more of a nightmare than it already was and is continues to be. Um, I was also unaware that the in 2015 because i guess because the the crime numbers were being touted as you know oh they're on record over year over year murder record lows um a were those numbers fungible like were they demonstrable because they i'm sorry I, what i meant to say was that srb as a result of these like lowered crime numbers laid off a bunch of cops um and obviously you were on the job during this period of time. What was the argument for that? And did, did it in turn maybe uh, get us to where we are now with the crime numbers? I mean, I, I think it was, it was the, it was, um, so the, the defund the police message is, is really not new in the sense that people for years have been saying we spend too much on public safety. If you were to spend this money on other things, it would be, it would actually address the root causes of crime. And there's a whole, debate about about that but she was trying to get at she's saying you know crime is lowering is lowering um is dropping <laughs> and uh you know maybe we can cut back on the number of police you know maybe our police force is is, is too bloated and now that we have less crime maybe we can put that money elsewhere mm -hmm. um you know one, one thing without getting too into the movies that people forget is that you know yes we spend 500 million on public safety and about 300 million on education, but the state contributes a billion dollars to education. It's actually 1.3 billion for education at the end of the day, and zero goes to public safety. So it's 1.3 billion to 500 million. And and, I'll, and I don't understand why people never mention that. It's, it's sort of like if you were to uh, go to the grocery store and your wife had already bought the vegetables, so you come home with only junk food. Well, you still, when you get home, you have vegetables and you have junk food, but you you only spent your money on that, and, and the other money was put towards um, healthy food. So I don't know. Yeah, I think it's just because it's not part of the narrative. It just hasn't been worked in. It needs to be hammered into people's heads that you know these are the these are the numbers. You know they exist. I think that that's not enough. That's fine, but I think the argument should 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 start from a baseline of like better information. Yes, absolutely. Uh, something you're very good at. So thank you, <laughs> Casey. Do you have anything in your notes that you would like to ask? Yeah. So the one thing that stood out to me is that there's all these examples of Jenkins just doing incredibly idiotic things. The thing that stands out to me is Step coming with him to a warrant that he wasn't supposed to be at yeah. and the officer recognizing him. <laughs> um, there's just so many examples of him doing these dumb things, but he escaped pretty much. He kind of only had like a slap on the wrist until... The, you know the, the task force got down so like was he, in your opinion like from what you've seen is he just a criminal mastermind or is he just really lucky so one of the things um there's a, a professor at uh, john jay college who, who uh peter moscos he worked for the police department for like a year to write a book he's a sociologist peter moss the author of stripper co everybody is he yeah okay <laughs> no no this is um I don't think so, but anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, well, no, I have to Google it. Hold on. So he, he talks about the the blue cone of silence, which is not the blue wall of silence, but it's like where you know something's going on and you don't want any part of it. You don't want to speak up because you don't, you know, you know you're not sure whether anything's going to happen, and then maybe they find out and you're a snitch and you start getting mistreated. And it's just like 
it's this thing where people like sort of just like, like I'm going to stay in my lane. I'm not going to speak up. I mean, I was astonished when I, I or at one point I talked to the Baltimore County police officer and he's like, everybody knew Jenkins and Gladstone were bad news. I'm like, everybody knew because everybody in the city police department seemed to think he was amazing and a, and a great cop. But you're telling me that the county officers knew to stay away from him. Um, yeah, that, that, that thing I found about Step and him at the search warrant scene is incredible. Um, you know, I got reports from like 10 different officers. They were all immediately told, write up everything you saw and document it. And, you know, that came up casually in a, in a conversation with somebody else. And because I had taken off, you know, so to, to work on the book, I was able to really drill down on stuff like that. And it's a very, it's a very telling scene. And, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that it's stood out to you because it, it does show a lot of different layers to this stuff. Mm -hmm. well, what was the biggest, in your mind, fallout from their activity? I know you had, there's the one example that stood out to me with, um, they, they robbed somebody of $10,000 that they were going to use to pay off a drug debt. And then a couple months later, they get shot. Um, so that, that stood out to me. I didn't know if there's, but there's, it affects a lot of people. There, there's a lot of dead people around this story. And, you know, with the, with the circumstances actually is sort of like un, unknown. Um, but I think, you know, there's those, there's those specific examples of, of actual harm done to actual people. But the greater harm, obviously, is the department's credibility. I mean, again, I, I said this earlier, but it, it cannot be emphasized enough. Post Freddie Gray, the department was trying to do everything it could to reform itself, to win back trust. And if this type of stuff can go on during that process, it, you know, there's, you know, I'm not trying to like put the, the nail in the coffin with this book, but it is what it is. I mean, they, you know, this is some really bad stuff that went on during the period where it was supposed to be reform going on. And, and it's, it's hard to like, and it created all sorts of, you know, there's so many question marks around people. There's people who work with Jenkins who now you got to look at and say, was he in on it? Maybe they weren't, maybe they had absolutely nothing to do with it, but who, who knows? And that's a scary thing. And almost all of the supervisors are still with the police department in supervisory roles. I mean, that, that, you know, Officers went to prison. Um, some resigned or lost their jobs, but the supervisors are all still in charge. And you know, they're—I don't know what—they haven't been willing to talk to me about whether they learned anything from this. Um, so, well, there there have been police departments where they've gone in and just fired everybody and said, "You can reapply, but you're all as of today, you're all fired." Why hasn't Baltimore done anything like that? Well, I think the departments where it's been done were definitely smaller. I, there's definitely bargaining issues there and, and you know um and, and again if we don't know who it, it, it's it's unfortunate that there's so many question marks about people who maybe have have no such we have no such reason to question or there's nothing there there's no there there but that's what a situation like this does it, it, especially when it you can't really i don't think we've gotten to the bottom of it i i really don't i don't think you know i think there are many more incidents and things that occur that we don't know about or, or haven't been able to report on it and like that, that sucks, you know, harrowing. <laughs> I have a, I have one, one minor question. Uh, it comes into play near the end of the book about uh, detective Suter. Uh, you received a phone call from a person who was the subject of, or was involved in a story that you did some time ago. And, you know, they basically were saying, this is a setup. Uh, it's totally an inside job. What, in what how would they have thought that? Like, how were they involved in any kind of capacity that they would have come to that supposition? supposition? Yeah. I, it, it, there's a little bit of cheating there in that narrative because it is really like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and it was, in the moment, it, it really was. I, you know, I don't know whether that person, I pursued that question for a while. And I think that person might have known that he was going to testify. They might have found out, hmm. you know, because once it happened, people started talking. And there's a, there's a connection to law enforcement there that I'm, I'm not going to share. But but I pursued that person to see what else they knew. And I believe that they, how do I say this nicely? Um, <laughs> I believe that person um, is uh, not well. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm, try, I'm trying to be polite. I, 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 don't, I think that they either guessed it and made it up. Or, okay. it, but, the, but the, there wasn't much more there. I got gotcha. you. So, but, yeah, I, I mean, but in, in that moment, though, to get that call, because there's, there was, you know, there was no public court hearings that week for that case. So someone says he was going to testify tomorrow. I'm like, there's no hearing. There's no trial. There's no venue where he would have testified. But the grand jury is secret. And, he, and in fact, he was supposed to testify the next day. And so it really was uh, uh, unnerving. 
Yeah. I mean, but that reaction, I think, was held by tons of people on the internet as well. That person just so happened to have your phone number. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. And that, so that's why it's hard to tell. But but I, I included it in the, just for a little bit of extra drama in that moment, because that's how it played out for me. Very good. Uh, any other final questions before we move along to the television show? No, I was just say this, this this week we just found out, but uh, I was going to I was going to lead into that right now myself. Go for it, dude. <laughs> well, this week we just found out that you have uh, We Own the City has been optioned by David Simon and HBO or whatever the actual phrasing is. We don't have to be legal here. Yeah. Uh, that's like super fucking exciting. It's very exciting. Um, it's been in the works for a while. Simon tweeted a picture of us working on it back in 2019. So it was like a kind of a poorly kept secret, but uh, it's moving forward now. I mean, they've, they've been working on it and it got greenlit and that leaked this week. <laughs> well, it was, it, it was absolutely the kind of, of announcement where it's like, oh, this is just coming out. I'm like, but wait, I feel like I've, I know this, uh, you know. Yeah, we we spoke about it on the show literally <laughs> last summer. Okay, because because he tweeted about it. I mean, there's been little breadcrumbs about it and stuff like that. And then there was a, a report that they were going to get the wire writing cast and producing the the writers and producers back together, which got morphed into it got garbled and it, and it got reported that the the cast was getting back together, like the wire the six. Right. So something to like clarify that. So yeah, it's been like out there but now it's out there out there and i i am just i would just want to say i'm thrilled that they're using the name that like, the synergy of that like i didn't think they would use the name of the show that's really cool to me um so i'm, I'm a consultant i'm not a producer i'm not a showrunner or anything like that it's based on my book and i'm helping them in the writer's room to make sure it, it stays true to uh the way things happen i but, i but you're you're looking at the potential thing. for uh receiving an, an emmy of some sort <laughs> well let's not get ahead of ourselves it's a it's a six-hour miniseries and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know when it's going to air, but it is definitely, I mean, look, those guys do amazing work and, uh, and I'm thrilled that their return to Baltimore is based on, uh, my work. So will, will Justin Fenton be part of the story or is this a, a focusing on the police side? Yes. I, I, I couldn't be in the story. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't, it, though I'm proud of my reporting on this, I, I did not uncover this, you know, this is, this was uncovered by the indictment. The indictment just landed out of the clear blue sky one day and, We've been trying to cover it ever since. So there's no, um, uh, you know, swashbuckling journalist character story in this miniseries. It's all in my notes. <laughs> uh, but surely, surely there will be an Easter egg in which you are a reporter, like at some sort of news conference. Because David Simon did it. You can do it. I yeah, know. I mean, they did that shit all the time in Homicide. Like Donna Hamilton shows up to ask Andre Brower a question. Uh, One of my friends uh, from New Orleans was had a, a little a small part in Treme, um, so yeah, I think they try to do that, but I, I don't know. I don't know. But this is this is the opportunity, the ultimate opportunity to loop this story into the Munchiverse, because there's got to be like some some cop scene where you know like characters from The Wire are standing around in the background, or Munch is like you know typing up on a computer or something like Your that. Belzer walks through like. Hey, who killed suitors? Same guy, you know, <laughs> killed Kennedy. Like the two; those are two things that he would love. The bells, yeah. This guy, there's got to be a way. It's a good idea. I also forgot. We've completely forgot to touch on uh, one of my favorite characters from the book, and uh, inevitably in the show is Donnie Stepp. Step, sorry, uh, Donnie Stepp. Name alone, Donnie Stepp. Uh, come on down to Double D's. Our company slogan is sexual. We do bail bonds. Thank you, jail. Get, get some double D's. <laughs> it's uh, uh, bail bonds and strip club merged into one with an all-you-can-eat hot potato bar. There, I did it. That's his character. That's that, that, that is the way he talks. Uh, and, uh, is it really? Yes, yes. Awesome. <laughs> and, and he's completely bald, right? Yes. I cast, I sit, so I pictured him as Joe Pantoliano. Okay. Does, did he have a mustache? No, nope. Well, either way, I put a mustache on him, but completely bald. So, like, Joey Pants, mustache, completely bald. But, yeah, I can't, I can't believe we forgot to talk about him in terms of the book because, like, he's definitely some comic relief involved in this story. Like, just showing up on busts and things like that. Way. Being, like, like, here's my, go out there. My, here, here's my badge. I got it out of one of them 50-cent quarter machines. Uh, it says, real policeman on it. Um, my badge number is eight. 
six nine four twenty. Yeah, six nine four twenty. His his story. I mean, he you know when he got busted, he just he flipped completely, and he's got about cell phone videos and cell phone pictures. To, you know, you wouldn't believe some of the stuff he's saying, and there's like pictures to corroborate it. Um, and you know, it's incredible to think that's one of the things that's like so complicated about this. We talk about Jenkins having different schemes going. I mean, he targeted this one uh, dealer for a robbery, but he calls Step ahead of time, like get there and clean it out before me and the, the rest of the guys get there. So I don't have to split it with them. I mean, like, you know, <laughs> that's a lot of stuff to to try to, and, and it, it, the potential for it to go wrong. Oh like, God. While he's in the house. I mean, like, it's just like, it's crazy. And, you know, I thought, you know, is there like, like, you know, security cameras and, and stuff all over the place. Like, I just, it's amazing how they didn't get flagged sooner. Well, in, in particular, that that instance in which they're out in the county and they're up to their little caper, and the county cop is like, "Why does this bald man look familiar to me?" Oh, right, I was investigating him for drugs. <laughs> Donnie Step, and and that kind of leads to one of the dumbest things that I, and, and it, to me in the book was the fact that you know, like they arrested the task force, and then Step just knew that they were arrested, but left all the drugs in his house. Like he had right. to know. That like someone was coming through his front door at any minute. He did dump the, some of the stolen watches in the in the water behind the house, but uh, yeah. I was gonna say I love the reference to the dive team <laughs> finding the watch in the creek. I just pictured the guy in the full scuba gear like poking around. I mean, yeah. I mean, think about it. He says the, the watch is in the water, and they go, "Okay, call the dive team." <laughs> <laughs> And, and then they bring the watch to court and they ask this drug dealer, like, was this your watch? Because he, because they robbed the drug dealer, took the watch, and then he gave it to Steph. But wasn't, wasn't that the guy who, there was a question as to what, he was a drug dealer, but they robbed him. They kidnapped him and his wife and robbed his house. And, you know, he gives that speech in court where it's like, this, this event ruined my life. This guy ruined my life, you know, and you're asking me about cash that I had in my house that he stole. Uh, and watches and things like that. Yeah, that well, was and that's the thing about Donnie Step is that, you know, he's easy to laugh at, but he's also tragic. Like, he had turned his life around. Right. And then Wayne Jenkins showed up on his door and said, have I got news for you? Yeah. Here's two trash bags of pills I looted from the CVS. Another thing that you really, you know, you can't make that, that stuff up. I, 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 I almost led the book with, with that scene um, because it's just like, it just brings together, like, you know, it really underscores how... You know, the, when the when the charges are read against the, the announced against the six officers, and the first person to send out an email to the entire BPD is Jenkins himself. I mean, like you just can't make that stuff up. Like, it's just remarkable. But uh, yeah, Step is, uh, you know, he um, he. Uh, you're right. It's a, it's it's a, it's a, it's a tragic it's tragic all around. And uh, I was gonna say each and every person involved in this story is a, is a tragedy in and of themselves, especially when it comes to the the culture in policing that that does this to people whether they're you know complicit in it or engaging in it fully you know it's this air that seems to uh infest our particular police department i have to assume other police departments in you know other parts of the united states i mean Ooh, what, that was what, a what deep, the characters, deep sentence what 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 are the characters i i didn't I didn't get to emphasize this later in the book and i wanted to is the, the antonio shropshire the drug dealer who sort of is the one being investigated that leads to everything. I mean, he's an interesting guy, and he, they don't accuse him of any violence. He's not accused of shooting anybody or anything like that. He got 25 years just like Jenkins, you know. Yeah, 25 yeah. 25 years, the same as a, as a cop abusing his power to rob people for years, and multiple robberies. And then there was the guy, um, um, uh, shoot, it's on the tip of my tongue, but he's um, he's one of the, uh, the victims who's robbed, and, you know, he's had this troubled childhood, and he's, he's just trying to get by, and, you know, he ends, up, he ends up robbing a liquor store and gets gets seven years, the same as you know, um, you know some of the officers who, who, who cooperated. And it's just like Mal Malik McCaffrey is his name. You know, I just you know I wanted to tell all the stories. I feel like there's there's officers caught in the middle of it, and you, how could you not know? And they explain from their perspective how they didn't know. You get the people who were victimized, you get the officers themselves. I wanted to create this like kaleidoscope of, of of people so you can better understand everything. But yeah, I, the amount of stories, the two pagers, as I call them, that that are littered throughout the the book, like I and and toward the end, it it's basically noted that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Like we have we have no way of knowing like how many other 
really awful things that the GTTF or other just random, you know, cops have done in the past, and we may never know. Uh, in fact, we, we're just never going to know. <laughs> um, but, I mean, getting to today, do do we see the tide turning at all? I mean, I know the murder rate is down by, like, a single-digit percentage, so, which we have to trumpet success on. Um, but how's the commissioner doing? How, what's the air like these days? I mean, you know, the, the, the jury's out. Um, you know, again, every commissioner I've covered in the past 13 years has talked about <laughs> all 27. So million. <laughs> well, I mean, they, they all they all can point to statistics moving in the right direction and policies that are in place and things are, are going to get better. And, and, and not to be like, you know, incredibly cynical, but, you, you know, you see what what we have as some of the results of that. I'm not saying it's an easy job either, but um, so we here we are again. We've got a, a new a new commissioner, and you know there's all sorts of new things being put in place, and we'll just have to we'll have to see. And what what I always say is I don't know when we'll know that the re- department's been reformed. Like how how will we know? Like what is right. the what are the metrics? And um, you know, and and can it be even quantified? Because there, let's face it, there's always going to be there's going to be officers who get in trouble and do the wrong thing or or use too much force or do something drunk and dumb off duty and like. That's that's not ever going to like stop in a large agency, I don't think. But like, so what's fair to like use as a as a metric to to judge success? I you know I think it might even be like an intangible thing. I I I think one of those metrics, and it's not hard to measure, is public reception. You know, you've got the people that that are supposed to be being protected by on the west side that have a very negative view of the police in Baltimore, uh, if and when it may be an imperceptible shift, but you know when the the uh, the view on local police starts to change. I think that's a very, very strong metric, even if uh, the murder rate is still over 300. Uh, and let's, you know. let's face it, there's a silent majority that relies on the police, that calls the police, that, that, that they, they have their on the, painted on their on the steps of their row home, no loitering. You know, they, they, they're, there's like a, I think there was like studies that came out, like a, that showed that um, like 70% or something of black Americans did not want to defund the police or, or reduce funding at all. So, I mean, there's like a, you know, that, that, and I think Brandon Scott, our current mayor, gets that. I think he comes from, he, he understands the role of police. I don't believe he's going to defund the police. Um, I think that he is going to be difficult, A, because of the consent decree, which requires higher funding for the police. And I think he he has, he grew up in Park Heights and he, know, he, he knows that people rely on the police to a certain extent. So I don't know where this conversation is going to go. I know that it's not, if it is going to happen, it's not going to happen anytime soon. He wants to set up a task force to study it. The, the next budget is already being worked out and it's, I'm sure it doesn't have any notable cuts and, you know, we'll just have to, it's something that I think the city's not going to grapple with until next year at the earliest. Yeah. I, I do feel like him coming into office, he, um, as opposed to previous mayors, like may have a better rapport with the chief of police and maybe the, the, the cops enjoy his presence more than some other people. Yeah, he's um, always enjoyed, uh, uh, had the ear of whoever was the, was the commissioner and the district majors in his area. Um, I think he sees the bigger picture for sure, sure and wants it to be layered in with stuff like safe streets and, and different things like that. But um, yeah. But yeah, now we're getting out of book territory. But I, I my one concern is his, his uh, perhaps um future as it relates to the mosbys because those two do worry me uh conflict of interest aside you know her position as the lawyer of the city and uh his city council president status but also all of the flack that's been going on recently with the two of them it's just like guys can't we just can't stop making headlines that are bad for ah stop it um do, do you see any any static you know maybe potentially between the the two parties uh the head of leadership of the city and like that power couple want to be power couple sorry for being so rude but, uh... i mean yeah that that, that is like the, the the personality conflicts and the power struggle is something that i think we're still trying to like we heard about that it's something we're you know keeping an eye on i guess is the best i can say um there are some interesting dynamics going on and you know, you see them play out sometimes, but, uh, you know, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> yeah. Mm. Well, anyway, uh, another topic I thought we might tackle before we're running out of time here. Uh, uh, the Baltimore Sun was recently purchased mm. by a, 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 a well-doer hotel magnate. Um, so, like, how does that work? <laughs> 
Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Paris Hilton bought it. Uh, ha- ha- yeah, like, what, what's the timeline for that? How does it work structurally? What's the mood like at work? I, I, like, what's going on, man? I have to admit, the Save Our Sun stuff, I, I just didn't, I'm very, you know, when it comes to faceless hedge funds, <laughs> <laughs> see how we could affect that. And lo and behold, you know, but to whatever degree that the people leading that effort were able to affect that, they, you know, it's happening, it, it appears. Um, we don't know a lot about it. We're, we are definitely trying to ask more questions. Until it happens, the guy's not allowed to talk about it. So it's not like he's like had yeah. a briefing with us or a meeting. But I mean, yeah, the, the basic gist of it is that like we're going to be sold to a local nonprofit and some other newsrooms like Philadelphia Inquirer and the Tampa paper. And I think, um, gosh, Salt Lake maybe have, have, have done that. You know, I, I don't know what the future looks like. Um, you know, it's going to be a different structure. It's going to be a different mission. Um, you know, there's something to be said for out of town owners who don't meddle in your business. <laughs> like, I don't know what it's going to look like when we have a, a local board of directors and what, like how that, that might, you know, that they might try to, Pedal influence, but um, I think we're all excited because it, the being passed around by hedge funds, there's nothing to look forward there. So this is this is like a new day, and, and hopefully, I think this, this this gentleman who bought it, you know, everything we hear about him is is good, and hopefully, he's trying to help us out, bring some mm. new. So I, that's great news for me because I like working here. I like covering Baltimore. Um, there's, great, there's incredible stories here as we've been talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they need to be, if I feel like if the sun isn't around, they don't get told. I, and that, that, that's no disrespect to any other media. What I'm saying is the sun's role is important and, and like we need to be uh, helped. And uh, if that's going to happen here, then I'm, I'm really excited. Well, if I had any recommendations, what I would like is if you could make the comic strips just a little bit bigger and maybe add a second page. Bring, bring back <laughs> God. Yeah, you know, like, God damn it! I just want to know what Jeffy and the rest of the family circus are doing. Jeffy, get off the counter. You know, Mary Worth, you bitch. <laughs> no, I think it's very exciting. Like, I, you know, it's. I, I think everybody roots for the sun. You know. Really, <laughs> except for yeah, except for everyone on Facebook. <laughs> well, right. Don't read the comments, Justin. Just never read the comments. I was going to say, I, I was gonna say the people who are, I'm just going to use the term intelligent, understand that when, you know, idiots on Facebook refer to the sun as some liberal rag, all they're really talking about is the board of editors or whatever, when they run an op-ed that endorse. And it also flip-flops. It completely flip-flops on daily. It's like, those centrists? Oh. I'm sorry, no, no, no. Like, the opinion of the people on Facebook. One day, when ah. they endorse Larry Hogan for his run as governor, they're like, oh, Baltimore Sun is a corporate uh, shill, etc. And then when you know they run some liberal thought piece, it's like ah, communists. Oh, I'm so tired of it. But I am a digital <laughs> subscriber, so there you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mad props to Steve Early for all his work. <laughs> Any other thoughts before we uh, close the interview, gang? Casey, Brian, I just think that everybody should go to Amazon, probably through our portal. And order this uh, delightful book. Yeah, we've moved uh, singles of units for for the the, the guests of the show. Wait, I want you we to tell. I want, I, I want you to tell the listeners what you said before we started, which was how fast you got through it. Brian, you said you read it how how quickly? Thirty six hours tops. Thirty six hours. Evan, you said like two sittings. I would say so I read it at a hundred pages at a time. I'm going to say tops twelve hours. Casey, and you read it, you're a speed reader, you read it in like 25 minutes, right? <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I've got a kid as well, so like I've got restricted hours, restricted yeah. hours. It took me about like four days, I think. There we go. See, look, listen to that. It, it, even if you don't like it, it, it doesn't, it's not a lot of your time will be, have, have been wasted, so that's... And it's, yeah, and it's very, it's just very <laughs> brisk. Uh, do you, you guys, when you read books, and this is like the first book, a physical book I've read in God knows how long, when you read a book, do you hold the chapter in your fingers while you're reading it to turn the pages so that you know like you're that much closer to the end of the chapter how do no! you game- how do you gamify <laughs> reading your books because i definitely gamify reading books <laughs> no you just turn page to page to page don't pay what? attention yeah. casey do you do hey, whatever else you can I, just, do. I just read until i'm ready to go to bed and then oh, okay all right <laughs> fine i'm weird I- whatever Oh, if yeah, you're a man. watcher or listener to this show and you do the thing that I just described, please comment. <laughs> I mean, I read a book a week and that's no. 
Okay. All right. Fine. There, there was one question from uh, the fam zone, um, mm. and it kind of overlaps with something that you had written, Evan. So, so oh. Justin, at any point during your reporting or, or since you've written the book, have you had any, uh, were you afraid for your safety at all? Mm. I mean, when you're writing about people who break into people's houses and use <laughs> authorized GPS trackers and, and, you know, plant evidence and stuff, it can definitely get, you can definitely see, uh, see shadows and, and ghosts and things like that. But I, I would say, uh, thankfully, no, uh, not, not, not any actual, uh, threats no yeah i was gonna say even to to your credit as a reporter there were there were there were no lines in the book that were like ppd sucks and you know that would probably spark some death threats via email but no it was just an even-handed fact factual report uh thanks. brian yes yeah thanks for coming back uh all right I was so this reading is <laughs> the wikipedia page of peter moss who definitely wrote serpico moss peter ghost moss. is who i was referring to so we're both right oh very good <laughs> All right, Justin, tell us where uh, we can find your product, your book, your, your amazing okay. book. Where all fine books are sold, your local bookstore is a plus. It's also available on The Big Guys. There's an audio book read by the great Dion Graham, who's got a, a tremendous voice. It does uh, the first 48 TV show narration and uh, was oh. a computer on the wire. He's great. There's an e-book. And so, uh, yeah, all those different ways to get it. And, uh, again, I hope, people, uh, I hope people learn something, you know. Uh, I try to pass along stuff I've – not just, you know, recording this book, but in like 13 years of covering this stuff. 13 years. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so. I, I, when I read your, your acknowledgments, it's like I was reading through all of the, well, mostly former Baltimore Sun people. I was just like, oh, I miss all these people. I think you and like I'm still Colin here. are the only people left that I know anymore. Well, listen, I'm still here. Yes, yes, you are. And uh, we will get a beer sometime after we get vaccinated. Yeah, I paid full price for this book, so I'm at least going to expect, uh, you know, a signature inside of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, all right. Thank you very much for being here, Justin. This has been episode 350 deuce of the CTB show entitled We Own This City. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you very much for listening and or watching. Thank you very much for being a friend. Thank you very much for being a fan. Have a great day and a better tomorrow.